So for those who have not heard my story, um, I did my undergraduate um, degree here in animal science, and then I um, started veterinary school here and graduated um, with the class of 1997. And um, so I was here in Davis for um, seven years, which was um, amazing. But then by the end of the seven years, I was ready to go. And now look at here, I'm back. <laughs> so that says a lot. Um, <clears throat> and um, so I had been in the Los Angeles area before I came up to vet school. Um, and when I remember I was in um, high school and we had uh, one of those kind of like school tours kind of a thing, I'm not sure if Hopefully high schools are still doing that. Um, but I remember being in high school and coming up to visit the UC Davis campus. And um, when I stepped onto this campus and just saw the green, saw everything, it was just everything that I had envisioned and wanting in a college. Um, so I was immediately sold. And the fact that the vet school was here was just perfect. So I was really happy here doing the, um, the, my seven years here, um, found community. Um, you, you had, I kind of had to look for community in terms of people that um, I could connect with on, on different types of levels. Um, one of the most important things when I was an undergraduate um, was connecting with uh, the UC Davis Gospel Choir, which I don't think is in effect anymore, but at the time, um, it was a club that later turned into a class um, and brought a lot of students, not just um, black students, but being gospel, um, a large part of that was black students. And so it was a really amazing way to connect with community. Um, and then obviously I had my animal science kind of community, um, which is different, um, but was still important. So then after uh, graduation, I was ready to head back down to Los Angeles area, and so I joined a nine doctor practice um, in Reseda, California, which is in the San Fernando Valley, if any of you know Southern California. And one of the things that really um, jumped out at me, I knew I was going to go back, actually I had two choices, I was either going to go back to the Los Angeles area or my family also lived up in the Seattle, my brother lived in the Seattle area, and so I was... Um, I fell in love with the way that looked. I don't know if you've ever seen the Pacific Northwest in the spring and the summer. It's just oh, gorgeous. So um, I kind of applied to both places, and the better job was in um, Southern California. And when the recruiters and people kind of coming up looking for jobs came up, um, one of the representatives from the hospital, McClave um, Veterinary Hospital, um, was a um, Lebanese woman. And so she's coming up and she's talking about, this, about the, the practice and all of that. And I remember she had like a, um, a photo journal of just things to show prospective applicants. And the diversity in this journal shocked me. Like it was like, wait, wait a minute. Why are all of these people of color in veterinary medicine? Like I, and they were mostly the support staff, um, but it was just phenomenal. I was just kind of like, it, it kind of surprised me um, you know, deciding to become a veterinarian as a young person and looking at all the examples of veterinarians, you know, you just kind of assume, all right, well, it's women and it's mostly Caucasian and okay, that's just what it is. I love the career. That's what I'm going to do. No big deal. Um, I have lived in lots of different areas, mostly um, suburbs. And so I am very used to being the only person of color or one of few people of color in the room. And so that wasn't anything that was daunting or upsetting. It just was just reality. And yet when I saw this booklet and I saw people of all different types and, and you know, people with color in their hair, you know, you know, crazy colors, which nowadays you all think is just the way it goes. But back then <laughs> it was a thing to have purple hair or something like that in the workplace. Um, piercings, again, nowadays it's kind of like how many, you know, if you only have regular two, then you're the weirdo, you know? But back then it was like, it was something, and it was to see this inclusivity and this, this practice was amazing. Um, and besides, it had all the other things that I wanted in terms of mentorship, et cetera. So um, I did join the practice um, and just loved it, loved it. It became a family, um, it became my community. Um, when I uh, 
got married. Um, so many of the support staff members were in my bridal party. Like it was just an amazing experience and really, really great um, high quality medicine. So fast forward a few years, um, the owners of the practice, there were two gentlemen, they were looking to retire and it was a pretty big practice. They had two, the main one, and they had a little side practice in a, a neighboring city in West Hills. Um, and so they um, sold and they sold to VCA, um, which at the time was probably one of the only types of companies that could afford the practice. So then I became a member of VCA, and um, by this point, I um, had adopted my son, and then I got married, and then I had more kids, and so started kind of doing the family thing and, and the work thing um, at the same time. And um, life kind of took me in a direction to consider moving to Seattle again, which is, you know, with um, wanting some family support uh, with my kids. And um, my marriage at the time was shaky, ultimately ended. Um, so moved up to Seattle. I was able to transfer within VCA to a four doctor practice in Seattle, which was amazing, loved it. And, but you know, the Pacific Northwest, um, it was, um, so not Seattle proper. I was kind of south of Seattle. Um, I lived in Northeast Tacoma, which is kind of in a, the federal way area, if you know that, that area up there at all. Um, so south, kind of between um, Seattle and Tacoma is where I lived. And then I practiced east of that out in Covington, which is starting to get out towards the boonies, which surprised me because <laughs> I didn't really, you know, all I knew was Seattle was Seattle. And now it's suddenly it's like, whoa, wait a minute, what is this? And I had cowboys and um, all sorts of folks that came in um, to, to practice, which um, I didn't quite expect, especially coming from Los Angeles. But it was, it was, it was good. It was good. Um, so I joined this, this four-doctor practice. Again, you know, became a family of mine. Some of my dearest relationships are from there. And... Um, you know, it was different in terms of diversity because practicing in the San Fernando Valley, you know, I saw all sorts of people, all sorts of socioeconomic situations, um, but all sorts of uh, races, religions, and, and all of that, which was, was great. Um, and moving into the uh, Seattle area, where I was was still, um, I still got to see a variety of socioeconomic groups and people with different situations, which was really great, you know, um, and important to me. Um, but racially speaking, um, definitely um, more universal in terms of Caucasian, which again, not necessarily a big deal, it's just kind of what I came to expect. Um, and then, Fast forwarding a few little bit more, fell in love with behavior, wasn't sure what I was going to do with it. Someone who was, people in the behavior college were encouraging me to pursue a residency and specialty. Ended up deciding to do that, and I figured if I'm going to do that, I have to, the only place I want to do that is here. Um, by this point, I'm getting a divorce. I've got three teens, younger, and a younger, or two teens and a young adult. So moved back here um, to. Honestly, when I, when I got the um, acceptance from the match, it really was just this message of like, okay, I'm going home, which I didn't expect, you know, because again, I kind of hightailed it out of Davis, in part because of lack of diversity, um, dating and such, it was just, I felt like I don't have people that I can identify with in, in, a, in, a, in a dating relationship sort of way. Um, and just wanting to get back into the culture, so to speak, of the Los Angeles area. But um, when looking at it from a different lens, you know, as now a single mom and trying to pursue an advanced career and wanting safety and familiarity and, and such, um, coming back to Davis was, was a blessing and I'm thrilled and that's partly why I decided to stay when the um, primary care position opened up. So that's kind of my journey. Um, the other thing, that kind of I think is pertinent to you know this month and, and the reason that I've been invited to speak with you is um, you know the journey as a person of color um, in this profession and um, when I, right after I got accepted for the residency that was um, we found out February 2020 
And then we know what happened right after that, right? And so not only the pandemic, but the, the world blowing up and George Floyd and, and all of the people before and after him that um, represented um, the racial divide that we have here. And in terms of politics, I, I'm, I'm a sensitive soul, so I was always the person that kind of just paid attention to as much as I needed to, to vote and do that sort of thing, but I can't really get caught up in it because it breaks my heart every time. I can't read the stories, I can't, I couldn't do that. And so I, I'm really, a, I have been a bury my head in the sand kind of a person, but um, I think the awakening for all of us with 2020 and, and the horrors that happened in that year pretty much made me say, well, no, I can't, I can no longer just pretend that it doesn't bother me. I can't just pretend that it doesn't matter. And I remember um, working um, in my practice before uh, I came down, and, and I, my, um, I have uh, biracial nephews and nieces, and um, one of my nephews had tried to commit suicide for reasons we don't completely no, but all of this was happening all at the same time. And I remember being at work and we were working in pods so that we could try to um, social distance. So there was like team A and team B. So it was a very small group of, uh, of people that we were working. And, and I loved everyone I worked with. And, you know, you, you're getting ready for surgery. You're doing whatever. The music's going. You're just talking about life. And we didn't talk a ton about politics and such. But I remember just having these conversations. It was almost like this muffled thing. And I just stopped and I said, I'm not OK. You know, I'm not OK. We're not, I, I need to talk about this stuff. Um, and my, the, the, my coworkers were amazing. And like, yes, let's talk about it. And you know, they, being Caucasian people, were kind of like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what's right, what's wrong. And we just had this really open, raw, honest conversation, which was amazing. But it was, it was kind of the first time I said, I don't want to brush off and ignore the impact of my race, my gender, um, at, at times my age, had on my experiences in veterinary medicine. So dialing it back, um, I lived, again, working in um, Reseda, California, very diverse um, area, so to speak. But where Reseda is, Reseda is kind of socioeconomically you know, lower, lower middle class, uh, perhaps. Um, but right next to that is Encino and Sherman Oaks. And, you know, just down the way um, would be Calabasas and, you know, and then West L.A., all of that stuff, right? So we had a lot of, and because we were 24-hour practice, we had a lot of different types of people coming in. And so one of the first experiences that, <clears throat> that I remember and st stood out to me in terms of um, prejudice was um, I was working, the way our shifts would go, um, I had to have like an eight to six shift. Uh, most of my shifts were eight to six, but once a week we would do like an eight to nine shift, so 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. And we had um, an overnight person who came on at six. So from six to nine, that was kind of the, the end of the day person shift and then the the emergency person. So we were kind of finishing up some of those urgent kind of cases before the day person left and then it was just emergency only. And so my colleague, he was doing whatever. He may have been doing surgery or something. I'm not sure what. Um, and um, I, um, prior to this, there was a person who I had, let me see, I'm trying to explain it. Um, at the time, we kind of had like walk-ins and we had, you could just say, I just want to see somebody. And so they would put you in the schedule and it was, you saw whoever happened to be available. And at one point, I had gone in to see this case about whatever it was. And the person was kind of cool and such. And then, you know, I go out to <clears throat> talk to the techs or whatever about treatment plan. And that person had gone up to the front and says, I don't want to see her. Um, my dog doesn't like black people, and I just, I don't want to see her. And so our manager had to come back and tell me all that, and I was kind of like, oh, okay, well, whatever. And so, you know, it stings, it's just like, but okay, I got lots of things to do, I'm just, whatever, fine, fine, fine. And so um, I, so fast forward, I don't know how much longer, how much in the future, but now it's this night shift, and this dog had come in um, with this person, 
and they were, and so they had marked the chart, no, no Dr. Davis, um, and so this person needed to be seen for this semi-urgent, not, not critical, but urgent care. And so um, they were told, okay, well, you're gonna have to wait because the other doctor is in surgery and da 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 and the only doctor here is Dr. Davis and you don't wanna see her. And he's like, oh, well, that's okay, I'll see her now. And so I get the chart and I'm looking like, oh, well, well, well wait a minute, this, is, this person doesn't wanna see me, this was that experience. Yeah, I know, but the dog is sick, and so he's okay now. He's willing to see you. Oh, well, no, 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 no. I'm not willing to see him. And the manager, she younger, you know, my age and such, and she was just like, I know, Gina, and, and, and you know, but it's the dog, and the dog is sick, and can, we, can you just do it for the dog? And I was like, I forgot what the, the nature of the problem was, but it could wait. And I said, you know what? You, I have to take a stand. I said, you have to stand somewhere. And if I don't stand now, then what am I? And it was hard to say no. And you know, of course, in our profession, everyone pulls upon our heartstrings and just do it for the animal. And so often we do to sometimes our own detriment. And in this instance, it would have been to my detriment. And I was just like, no, I, I'm not going to do it. Um, and so the animal had to wait. And it was the first time that I had said, it's not okay to be treated this way. Um, in terms of, even in Los Angeles, how often did something like that happen um, where somebody says, mm, I don't wanna see her? Often enough. Um, a lot of times I didn't necessarily know the reasons. You come up with all sorts of explanations. I am a, again, kind of a sensitive, touchy-feely, um, woo-woo-woo kind of a veterinarian. Um, and that fits for a lot of people who need that. And then there are other people who are like, just cut to the chase, stop, just what? What do you want me to do? And such, and that, we had doctors like that in our practice. And so it's, that's the beautiful thing about in a multi-doctor practice, you can find the style that matches you. And so if someone was kind of like, yeah, I just want to straight and narrow, then that was fine. I've had people who said, I don't want to see a woman, which is ironic, because it's like, oh, okay, well then you're gonna be in trouble because most of the veterinarians are women, but that didn't matter. At the time, I was in my early, uh, late 20s. I don't want to see a young person. So there's all that stuff. And, um, you know, I've, there, there were times you, you walk down the street and someone yells slurs, like this is just the reality for many of us, right? And um, I grew up in this. I grew up in the Midwest being the only black kid in class, um, being told that um, less was expected of me even though I was at the top of my class, things like that. And so you just bury it, right? So now here we are, we're in the 2020 and beyond and suddenly we're just not going to stop having these conversations. Now we're gonna talk about it. Now we're gonna look at it and we're gonna say, you know, the, the concept of microaggressions has been there forever, forever, but it was nothing we talked about. Um, it was nothing that we addressed. Um, when you are in a field where you have to compete with a lot of people and you have to be the best of the best of the best and you have to be driven and so many of us are type A and all of these things, you can't let anything get in your way. So you brush off whatever little microaggression that might be coming your way, whatever, whatever little judgment about your, who you are, it's because you want this and I'm gonna do whatever I have to do and we're gonna sacrifice a whole lot to get it. And so here we are. Um, but does it matter? Does it affect us? It does. Um, the, the most convenient thing for clients is to say my dog does not like and you get that all the time I get it all the time the dog does not like black people and so now there's an example of one where I was in Seattle in my Seattle practice and um, I go in and <laughs> it's like two or three two little like chihuahua terrier little things just bouncing all over the room and I hadn't seen this client before and so I walk in the room, you know, I don't remember, hi, Mrs. Jones, oh, hey, you know, Fluffy and, and Rocky. And the woman's like, oh, you're black. Yes, I am. <laughs> so, okay, how can I help you today? And she's like, oh, um, well, I mean, 
gosh, this is, I don't know, it's really awkward, but like, I, you know, we haven't seen a black doctor. My, doc, my dogs, you know, I don't, my dogs don't really like black people. Meanwhile, I got these dogs. You know, and, it, and I'm in my behavior phase by this point. So I'm doing all my behavior magic and, treat, you know, these dogs are coming over to me, jumping on me. I, you know, I pick one up and the, you know, all this stuff. And she's, as she's literally saying, my dog does not like black people. And I said, seems to me that Rocky is just fine. So we can either talk about your situation and figure out what's going on, or you can wait to see when one of my colleagues will be available. Uh, oh, no, I mean, uh, uh, no, sure, 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 we can do that, no, you know, and so she's flustered, she, she, I hope she's embarrassed, <laughs> like, you know, and we went on with it, and I come out of the room, and my colleagues, and you all who've been in small animal practice in these small little old buildings where you hear everything, <laughs> you know, I come out the back hall, and they're just like, <laughs> did she, uh, what? And I was like, whatever, let's just, we need a CBC, whatever we needed to do for the dogs. And you go in the office and you sit down and you're just like, mm. but got to go, got the next one to come, go, you just, whatever. And so you deal with it. Um, so around this time, I, uh, because of the type of way I, that I practice, I believe, um, I had a, a really, I had a really good following, and then when I started doing behavior, and that just like opened so many doors. It's like a floodgates. When you start doing low stress handling, and now especially with social media and stuff, the word of mouth, and so in terms of people requesting me, um, was huge. But even before I had started doing behavior in practice, um, just because of of my my way of practice, um, I, I was popular. Um, with a lot of people. There's a little local um, newspaper um, that covers like these three different little cities together and they have the best of every year. Best pizza place, best grocery store, best barber, best everything, right? And so they had best veterinary clinic and best veterinarian and like my after my first full year there I got the best veterinarian award and it was like whoa what is this you know um, and then I got it a couple, you know, a couple of years after that. And then it was between me and my bestie, and we were kind of like, "Who's going to get it?" <laughs> you know. And so she, it's like she got it. Like I got it twice, and then she used to get it before me. And then so she got it, and we're like, "I'm happy for you, but I'm coming for you next year." <laughs> you know. And so it was just this little game. It was a nice thing to kind of say, "Wow, you know what? People appreciate what I'm doing, but I'm just going to be me. I'm just going to do what I'm going to do." So you have all of this external acknowledgement of who you are and what you're doing, people praising you, people requesting you in that sense. And yet, there was this, we were like electronic records by now, and I also, in this four, actually by the time we were about a five doctor practice, I had the most do not want to see. And all this time I have said over the time when I've had that mark on my charts, and it's just, you know, my practice style's not for everyone. But now here I am, <clears throat> and I'm getting praise and awards for my practice style, and yet, of all of us, I've only, and I hadn't been there as long as some of the others, and yet I had the most do-nots. And I look through these charts, and I'm like, did I misdiagnose something? No. Did I, you know, there's no, like, um, the logs of what happened and when the clients complained. There was none of that. It was just don't want to see her. And it started to really just, like, I had a period of time where it really just got me. Like, just, like, I don't even, it was hard to put your finger on. And again, we don't, and I don't, I'll speak for my version of black culture. Um, you don't talk about this kind of stuff, you know? You just got to get over it. Just get, just pick up, just be better, just be bigger and better, and don't worry about it. Prove it, prove them wrong by being successful and such, but we don't have these conversations um, because they, they just tend to end in frustration. So it was starting to eat at me and eat at me, but still kind of like I didn't necessarily have an outlet for it. That was, this was probably a year or two before the 2020 when everything kind of erupted. So, um, so those are some of the examples, but I would say I probably got some reference to my race in every year of my practice, at least three or four times um, during my practice years. 
And so now I'm here. And um, we all know the diversity or lack thereof of UC Davis and, and School of Vet Med. Um, it's getting better. It's getting better. Um, I'm hearing good things about some of our incoming classes in terms of diversity and such. Um, and I do believe that everyone here is making a concentrated effort to, to improve this. Since we've been here, um, and since everything's happened with election years and George Floyd and COVID and, and all of the things that our nation is going through, the conversations that we're having here on campus are happening. And they may not always happen as smoothly as we need. Maybe we don't necessarily feel like they're happening as often as we need. But I do believe that, that the interest in having these conversations is real. Um, so now let's see, I'm in my first year of residency and um, we, at this time, we are seeing um, clients in the, well, it's our, new, it's our current space now, the behavior space over here. Um, at the time, it was still um, the, the old bookstore, so it was kind of storage and such. But um, because of behavior, you can't do that. Um, you have to, you can, I can't just say, oh, I'm going to do curbside. To, you know, and take the animal inside because the whole thing is conversation. So for social distancing, the behavior service, we were outside in the agility yard, but then weather and life happened. And so we moved into the bookstore and just kind of had like a big circle and such. So we are um, coming over with this woman who um, had a shepherdy kind of big dog that she had fear aggression towards people and dogs and the whole situation, the whole behavior situation was just a disaster. She was trying to get this dog as her support and um, emotional and physical support dog, but this dog was afraid and aggressive towards everything. So she's, it's like, this dog cannot do the job you need it to do. Um, and you know, she needed it to like be able to help her, like if she fell, help her get up and all sorts of things. So there was all of that and trying to just show her from the dog's perspective, why this was not going to work, but also teach her about what the dog was doing. So um, usually what we were doing is what the technician uh, trainer would go over to the parking lot, bring the people over to the bookstore, and the students, myself, and um, I don't know if I was still being mentored at that time or if uh, Dr. Stella just happened to be present just because, but she was there too. And um, so usually we are seated. They bring the dog into the room with the client. The client sits at the couch kind of away from us. We're in a, like a semicircle, and then we start talking. In this instance, we hadn't had it finished the pre-visit um, conversations. So the students and I were outside when the clients came in and sat down. And so we, we're about to, to file in. So it's myself, Dr. Stello. Um, there were two Latinx um, students, one male, one female, and an Asian student happened to be on the rotation. Um, and so we walk in, and as soon as the students file in, they're about to come in, and I come in, and you get the, you hear the, oh, Rocky doesn't like black people, like instantly. And so I'm just like, son of a, like really? Like, really? So then I just kind of freeze, and I'm like, okay. Now, meanwhile, these are dogs. All the cases that I see, almost all the cases I see are fear aggressive animals who may not like anybody or may not like anything, right? So I'm used to dogs who say, I'm afraid of dot, dot, dot. <clears throat> so this dog was your run of the mill, I'm nervous about people. And we know how to, to approach them. We know how to not approach them. We know how to do all this. So the dog was over doing what all of our patients do. You know, he's alert, he's kind of, you know, he wasn't even, I don't even think he was really growling or barking at that time, but you know, he was stressed and, and anxious. Um, and so I was kind of like, okay, well, he's over there, he's tethered. I'm like, we're gonna be over here. I'm sure it'll be fine. She's like, I don't know, I don't know. He's like, I'm worried for you. I, uh, he might attack you. And the, again, the dog is just kind of like our little corky back there. <laughs> you know, he's just, he's just minding his own. He's just, He's just doing the best he can, right? And he's not being any more aggressive than any others. And some of them are quite like, you walk in the room and you're like, oh, I hope that tether holds. And that was not what we had here. And so Dr. Stella was like, well, why don't we just get started in all of this? And um, so I'm sitting there 
And so she then has to, she has to explain herself and she has to explain how this dog was rescued from um, a dog fighting ring and the guys who had the dog were Mexican and they used to do, you know, be mean to the dog to get it to fight. And so he, you know, if he sees Mexicans, then he, you know, might show aggression. And she's saying all this as I've got two Latinx students next to me. And, and she's like, yeah, so, you know, like, so, you know, dark people, he, 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 he may not. And she, so she's just babbling and, I, and I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, are you kidding me, right? And so behavior appointments are long, very long, too long. <laughs> and, you know, like two and a half, three hours long. And so I'm sitting here at the very beginning of this and I'm fuming, like I'm fuming. And I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, like, what do I, like, I want to, I, I don't want to see this. I'm not going to see you. Like, I'm at this point kind of, it took me back to that moment, you know, when I was in my early career. And I was like, I don't have to deal with this. I don't, I don't have to deal with this. And so I'm sitting there half listening because I'm having all of these thoughts and trying to decide what to do. And um, we, at Typically what we were doing at that time is we didn't take like a break. We'd get the history. We already had a good idea of what we were going to recommend. So we'd already kind of prepped the students for it. So we pretty much tried to just stay in the room and do the whole visit all at once. But at this point, I was like, you know what? Let's take a break. Let's go outside. Let's talk about what we heard in the history. Let's talk about our plan and then come back and deliver it. And so we go outside and I was just like, I don't know that I want to continue with this case. Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm pissed. I'm not even able to concentrate. And I remember thinking to myself, all of the things that you go through, so it was my own feelings, but it was also, you know, as a resident and a clinician, I'm supposed to be teaching. And I'm like, what example, like, I was just all over the place. Like, what example am I setting for our students, these students of color who are going to experience something like this? Um, and um, Dr. Stello, I think, was just really trying to keep the peace and trying to keep everybody, let's just get through it, let's just get through this thing, let's just diagnose, treat the dog, and we can re you know, reconnect and such. And so I was like, okay, well then you need to take the case and I will sit here, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm done. And so she did, and so she kind of took the lead and we finished the case and such. And, you know, so afterwards, the students and I, we talked about it and, you know, we had the kind of conversation you would imagine we all talked about it. And it's a learning experience and such. But um, it was just, it was just another example of the, the, the difficulty that we have and the choices that we have to make. And um, I'm at a place <clears throat> in my age, in my career and such um, where I'm just like, no, I'm done. I'm done with this, right? I'm not going to be silent um, to keep everybody else comfortable. I'm not going to, I'm going to speak my story. Um, I'm going to do my part. One of the things that I'm most excited about being um, a faculty member, and I've kind of, I've, I've said it ever since I kind of thought about it, it's like, I want a seat at the table to have the conversations with the people who are having the conversations. I want to weigh in. I want to understand and I want to represent and on all sorts of topics, not just diversity topics, on all sorts of topics. Curriculum, I got opinions. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a junior faculty member, so I'm, I'm, I'm being quiet and I'm learning, but I, I have questions. <laughs> Why are we doing that? <laughs> like, <laughs> I got a lot of opinions about a lot of things, but I also know that I need to listen and learn um, before I can weigh in on some of these things. Um, so. That's kind of my story. That's just kind of some of the things that I've gone through and where I am now. Um, I, <clears throat> I know we have a current um, topic, so to speak, of, of conflict with um, our Jewish friends and our um, Palestinian friends and all of that and the pain that's going on with that. Um, it feels like there's always something that is trying to put people against people. And I, I think that particularly if we are able to remember 
the passion and the calling that we have for veterinary medicine um, and the deep care that we have for the animals. I think most of us got into this for the animals. And I don't know if you were like me, where you're like, I want to do it for the animals. And then you get in and you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much people stuff. Like, what is happening here? But then I've also learned to embrace that, but that, that forms its own challenges and such. And so, um, you know, I think that we are in a good place. I think we're in a, a relatively safe place if there is such a thing, <laughs> you know, here. Um, I'm encouraged by what we're doing. I'm encouraged by these kinds of things. Um, I am so impressed with your generation um, of students and humans. Um, you guys are amazing. You are advocates for yourselves and for each other. Um, you speak your mind. Sometimes you get criticism, not sometimes, you often get criticism for it. Um, but hold tight um, because it matters. Um, don't let anyone silence you. Um, there are ways to play the game, and it's unfortunate that it is a game, but it is. Um, but um, there are ways to do it where you can keep yourself, keep your integrity, um, and still work towards change. So 